next talk by, by Grace Fields. I'm very happy to introduce you. Um, so Grace is going to talk about the latest frontier in analog gravity. So please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and thank you for the introduction. I'm going to be coming at this from more of the philosophy side. Uh, so I'm the opposite. There won't be many equations. There might be a few technical philosophy terms, but I'll try again to make those accessible. But do interrupt me if you have any clarificatory questions along the way. I'm going to be talking about some new roles for analog experiments, and hopefully this is kind of a natural continuation of the discussion that we started with Patricia's talk this morning. So the story behind this work really started at a conference in December 2019, uh, right before everything shut down. It was called The Next Generation of Analog Gravity Experiments. And it showcased all of the most recent cutting edge experiments that are happening in the analog gravity field. And it, it seemed clear from listening to those talks and then looking a bit more closely at the journal issue that came out of that conference as well, that the physicists working on analog experiments in analog gravity are using those experiments in new ways and for new reasons. And this is hinted at even in that journal issue. So the organizers write, over the last few years, a new wave of experiments have appeared facing different challenges and attempting to extend the analogy beyond the observation of the Hawking effect in the laboratory. So what I want to do here is to highlight some of those new experiments and new goals that have arisen recently in the analog gravity literature. And then to suggest that those developments highlight new roles for analog experiments in general. And I'll be talking about two new roles specifically. I'll start by briefly summarizing what I'll call the original goal behind analog experimentation. I won't spend too much time on that because it's already been gone through in Patricia's talk earlier. Then I'll briefly summarize the new experiments and new goals that we're seeing in analog gravity. I'll explain how those reveal two broader roles for analog experiments. Uh, first, detecting general or generalized phenomena. And second, exploring the analog system. And then I'll talk about some connections between those roles, some implications of them, some of their advantages. And finally, I'll ask, what does this mean for the analogy in analog experiments? So first, the original goal. What were analog experiments originally designed to do? As Patricia ha has already gone through, uh, what, you'll, what you'll read in a typical exposition of analog experimentation is that you run an analog experiment when you have two systems. One system that you really want to learn about, which is both inaccessible and unmanipulable. And then another laboratory system, which is accessible and manipulable, and which is mathematically similar to the system that you want to learn about in important ways. And then according to what I'll call the original goal, what you want to do with this experiment is to manipulate the source system and use the results of those manipulations to learn about the target system and specifically to test hypotheses about the target system. So you might have an astrophysical black hole like the one on the left here, and you might be wondering, does it actually exhibit Hawking radiation? And then you might have an analog system, a bit like this waterfall here, a flowing fluid system that has mathematical similarities to your astrophysical system. And you might be thinking that you can run an experiment on the fluid system to see if that system exhibits Hawking radiation and use that to determine whether the astrophysical system exhibits Hawking radiation. So in analog gravity so far, um, this is the original goal that dominated the first couple decades of research. The question of interest was, do the simplest kinds of analog black holes, so one plus one dimensional analog black holes, produce analog Hawking radiation. And that question was considered interesting to the extent that it could teach us about whether astrophysical black holes produce astrophysical Hawking radiation. And this is the kind of question that has been presented as the goal of analog experimentation more generally in the philosophy literature. So analog experiments have been presented in the philosophy literature as experiments that ask, does some analog system produce some analog phenomenon? 
in order to learn about whether a target system produces the corresponding target phenomenon. But then the question here, obviously, the controversial question is about whether these experiments can actually succeed in this goal, whether we can actually extrapolate from some laboratory system to some astrophysical system that's governed by completely different underlying physics. And that question has been controversial. Some people have defended analog experiments uh, and their original goals. So they've argued that analog experiments can actually confirm hypotheses about their target systems. The strongest defense of this so far has been in a paper by Dardashi et al. in 2019, where they construct a Bayesian network to argue that as long as we have an appropriate universality argument, and this is why universality arguments are so important uh, in the context of analog Hawking radiation, then we can get confirmation for our hypothesis about the target system based on evidence that we collect in the source system. How does this work in a bit more detail? Well, you have, th this is a Bayesian network and each of these circles rep represent binary variables. So variables that can take on two values. The E represents evidence collected on the source system. So it's gonna take a positive value if the evidence that we collect on the source system supports our hypothesis about the source system and a negative value if it does the opposite. MS is our uh, hypothesis about the source system. So the variable MS is going to take on a positive value if that hypothesis does turn out to be empirically adequate and a negative value otherwise. MT over here is our corresponding hypothesis about the target system. So for example, that the target system exhibits Hawking radiation. And it's going to take a positive value if that hypothesis is true and a negative value if the hypothesis is false. And then up here, the X is what represents a universality argument, which if it is true, supports MS, our hypothesis about the source system, and MT, our hypothesis about the target system. And the idea is that this universality argument acts as a bridge between MS and MT. So if we get evidence that supports the adequacy of our hypothesis about the source system. Then we can go from this bubble to this bubble. And then that evidence has indirectly confirmed our universality argument. But because the universality argument, if true, supports our hypothesis about the target system, then we get indirect confirmation of our hypothesis about the target system. This is the, the strongest representation so far of how analog experiments might be able to succeed in their original goal. But not everyone agrees, right? So Crowther et al. specifically argued soon after that we can't assume that we can draw this arrow between X and MT. We can't assume that we know enough about the target system to be able to claim that the source and target system are in the same universality class. And in fact, they go so far as to say that that is presupposing probabilistically what we would like to establish. So there's an in-principle concern here about whether we can ever find a universality argument for which we can draw these two arrows. But then also, as Patricia highlighted earlier, there's an, a practical problem for Hawking radiation because we don't currently have an argument um, that, for which we are confident that it's relevant to both the source and target systems. And the point of all this is just to show that the original goal of analog experimentation, specifically in analog gravity, is highly controversial. And that's one of the reasons, uh, I think, why the new experiments and new goals that we see emerging are so interesting. So I'll highlight uh, the, some of the new experiments we're seeing and the new goals in analog gravity and then go on to talk about these two new roles that I think they reveal. As I said before, in the first couple decades, analog gravity experiments were really focused on detecting Hawking radiation in the simplest possible analog black hole systems in one plus one dimensional systems. Over the last few years, you see more of those experiments and specifically one plus one dimensional experiments in new media instead of just using 
uh, surface gravity waves in water tanks and Bose Einstein, phonons in Bose-Einstein condensates. You're also seeing analog experiments with light, for example, as you see in this paper. But the community is also moving on to more complicated analog black holes, two plus one dimensional experiments. And those are able to represent rotating black holes. And because of that, they're able to represent all sorts of other phenomena beyond talking radiation, phenomena that only appear in rotating black holes. So we're no longer interested in, in only Hawking radiation anymore. And even further, not all of the experiments are even focused on black holes anymore. There's experiments coming out which are instead trying to model whole universe effects like this paper that's using a rapidly expanding Bose-Einstein condensate to model the expanding universe in a lab. So the experiments have evolved they're no longer only interested in Hawking radiation, they're no longer only interested in black holes. But it would be perfectly possible for all those developments to occur, but still correspond to the original goal. But it doesn't seem as if that's the case. It seems like a lot of these new experiments are actually attached to new goals. And there's two goals in particular that stick out. First is what I'm going to call detection of generalized gravity phenomena. And second is ex exploration, exploring the behavior of analog gravity systems. So I'll explain both of those goals as they appear in analog gravity, and then argue that they can be generalized uh, to all analog experiments. First, the detection of general and generalized phenomena. In analog gravity, especially since 2017, so the last four years or so, there's been a move away from thinking of Hawking radiation as an astrophysical phenomena towards thinking of Hawking radiation as a much more general process that you could expect to find in any number of different systems that satisfy certain minimal mathematical conditions. And alongside that shift, there's been a shift away from thinking of analog experiments, analog gravity experiments, as indirect detection of this astrophysical Hawking radiation, and towards thinking of, the, of those experiments as direct detection of the more general Hawking process. And you can see that, for example, in this quote from a recent paper by Petty and Koenig. They write that while Hawking radiation itself is strictly defined as spontaneous pair creation near the event horizon of an astrophysical black hole, it's one particular instance of a more general effect of emission into positive and negative non-partner modes, which we could call the Hawking process. And they write that to date, the Hawking process has been studied in a huge variety of condensed matter systems. There's two important claims that are being made as part of this one quote. In the first half, they're arguing that our concept of Hawking radiation should be generalized. They're arguing that we should be thinking about the Hawking process and not only astrophysical Hawking radiation. That's the first side of the claim. But then in the second part, they are directly asserting that this more general process is observed and directly detected in our analog systems. It's not only indirectly observed as the analog of some other effect. It's important, I think, to to appreciate that the generalization that's going on here isn't just a semantic shift. It's not just that uh, the community constructed many analog experiments and saw analog Hawking radiation in a variety of systems and then decided that it must be a more general effect. Instead, the generalization is actually based on independent mathematical results uh, that have actually been known for quite some time. Um, so, uh, this goes back to the paper that I think Eric mentioned earlier by Matt Visser called Essential and Inessential Features of Hawking Radiation. You can show independently of analog experiments that there are only certain minimal conditions that need to be satisfied to get a prediction of Hawking radiation out of your theory. And in fact, those minimal conditions don't have anything to do with gravity and Hawking radiation could have been predicted in any number of other contexts. So there's some independent grounds for the generalization that's going on here. And I want to argue that the, there's no reason why 
analog experiments beyond analog gravity can't also play this kind of role. So they're not only useful for indirect detection of target phenomena, they can also be useful for direct detection of general phenomena, or as in the case of Hawking radiation, recently generalized phenomena, phenomena that we only recently realized are actually more general than we initially thought. Why is this role useful? Well, it's useful in the same way that any conventional experiment is useful. In a sense, this new role is turning your analog experiment into a direct detection conventional experiment, and it's going to be useful for the same reasons. That's the first goal. And the second one is exploratory. There's two kinds of questions that exploratory questions that seem as if they've come up in recent years in analog gravity. The first is a kind of an open ended question, something like how do analog gravity systems behave under different conditions. And the second is more specific. It's about the robustness of predicted phenomena, something like under what conditions will a predicted analog gravity phenomenon actually appear? Both of these kinds of questions are exploratory in the sense that they're not designed to test a hypothesis. There's no hypothesis testing in mind here. That's not actually the goal of the investigation anymore. So this first kind of question, the open-ended question, might be about asking all, all kinds of smaller sub-questions. You might be wondering how do the analog systems evolve over time? Or how do processes in those analog systems unfold? And you can see this kind of exploration in this quote from, from a recent analog black hole ex experiment called Bovet Alright, uh, that spontaneous Hawking radiation in analog black holes was suggested, developed theoretically and observed. Here we repeat the observation at various times and follow the time evolution of Hawking radiation in an analog black hole. We compare and contrast the evolution with the predictions for real black holes. I think it's clear here that they're not trying to test any particular hypothesis by running this experiment. Instead, they're taking a system, they're setting it up, and they're just watching it evolve and seeing what happens to it. And only at that point do they then go back and start thinking about comparing and contrasting to real black holes. On the other side, the other exploratory question, uh, we're looking at something more specific and we're, we're looking at predicted phenomena and the robustness of those phenomena. We might be asking what happens if we violate idealizations that we think should actually be necessary to produce those phenomena? Or what if we take that phenomenon into a regime that we don't actually understand theoretically? Will it still appear? Will it appear with slight alterations? This kind of goal uh, has been really emphasized in recent work, uh, actually in the Hawking radiation experiments. Uh, so you can see this quote from Torres 2020. He writes, it's known that this analogy, as in the analogy between the astrophysical and fluid black holes, holds only under specific conditions, which were not all satisfied in this experiment. The deviations from the analog regime, vorticity, <laughs> have spurred the development of our concepts to new regimes, which deepened our understanding of various processes such as super radiance or vortex relaxation. So in this case, the, the exploration was almost accidental. He's talking about an experiment that wasn't able to satisfy all the conditions that the experimentalist wanted it to. But then he's emphasizing that that is actually interesting in himself. And then later on in the paper, he goes on to urge people to run these experiments on purpose to violate idealizations and take predictive phenomena out of the predicted regimes on purpose to see what happens and to get a better understanding of what's actually required to produce those phenomena. Again, I, I argue that these exploratory roles can be generalized. Analog experiments can be useful for open-ended exploration so for looking at the analog system to see what we find, asking questions like what would happen if? And they can also be useful to specifically explore the robustness of predicted phenomena, to take predicted phenomena beyond the regime in which they were predicted, and to ask questions like what would happen to this predicted phenomenon if? This, uh, this role is useful for, for any number of reasons really exploration can reveal new regimes it can reveal new effects it can surprise us 
but also the, the robustness, the exploration of robustness in particular, can push us to examine our theory. So if we see something, if we see robustness that our theory tells us that we shouldn't see, or if we see robustness that our theory doesn't yet have an explanation for, that can push us to expand our theory in interesting directions. So we have two new roles for analog experiments, and now I'll go through quickly some connections between them and some implications of them. First, you can have overlapping goals and overlapping roles. So you can have an experiment that was, for example, designed to detect some generalized phenomenon, um, but that in, inadvertently or by accident actually explores the robustness of, of some phenomenon because it's unable to satisfy all the required idealizations. But you could also have experiments that were designed to do those two things at once. So some combination of the two roles. Exploration can also lead to generalization. So by exploring the analog system, you might find unexpected robustness of a phenomenon or a phenomenon appearing in regimes where you hadn't expected it to. And that might lead you to then go back and look at your theory and see whether actually you should re, uh, recalibrate your understanding of how general that concept is. And to some extent, this seems to be what has happened with Hawking radiation. It's partly the analog experiments themselves that have motivated the community to step back and start thinking about Hawking radiation as a much more general process. Both of the new roles, especially the exploratory one, can also lead to technological advances and unexpected applications in other fields. And this has already happened with analog gravity. Uh, one of the optical experiments, the optical black hole experiments, actually happened upon a regime that could be used to create a highly tunable and efficient laser source. And finally, one main advantage of both of these roles is that they seem to avoid the controversy that I highlighted in the beginning. Because neither of them are aimed at testing hypotheses about the target systems, that whole question about whether analog experiments are able to test hypotheses about the target systems doesn't really come up. That seems as if it's an advantage, but it also leads us to this final question, what happens to the analogy? If both of these new roles are focused on the analog system and are not about testing hypotheses on the target system, then in what sense are they still analog experiments? Is the analogy still relevant? And can they teach us about the target system at all? And I want to argue that they can indirectly teach us about the target system in two ways. First, by learning about the analog system, we learn about what the target system might look like if it had certain features. So we, we might understand how would it behave if it belonged to universality class A, if it had certain features that uh, characterize a universality class that we might call type A. And by exploring more and more, more and more analog systems in different regimes, we might learn about how all of these different universality classes behave. And how does that help us learn about the target system? Well, I think it relates back to where the controversy lies. The, the problem with the confirmation along this diagram is about whether we can be confident that the source and target systems lie in the same universality class, the universality class specified by our universality argument. And that's why there's, there's a question mark here. And the problem for Hawking radiation is we don't currently have a universality argument for which we are confident that the target system actually lies in that universality class. But the idea here is that the more possible universality classes we investigate, the more possible scenarios we understand. And then in the future, we might learn more about the target system and that actually it does fall into a class that we've already investigated by exploring different analog systems. So that's the first way that I think, uh, especially the exploratory role can indirectly teach us about the target system. Second, by learning about the analog system, we can point theorists of the target system in promising directions. So, we might be able to push theorists to ask, what if the target system also evolves like our analog system? Or what if this mechanism that we've seen by exploring the analog system is also the mechanism behind a target process? And we can also ask them, 
what if uh, what if there's a universality argument that explains this unexpected robustness? And what if that universality argument is actually applicable to the target system? So this, se this second contribution kind of relates to the first in that way. And uh, all of these questions are questions that, you know, we might not have even thought of if we hadn't done the analog experiments. We might not have uh, considered those to be interesting questions to ask. So we have two new roles for analog experiments. Uh, they're useful in their own right I would argue, but they can also indirectly teach us about the target system in these two ways. Finally, finally though, I just wanted to emphasize that I don't think that these new roles are alternatives necessarily to the, to the old role or that they should supersede the old role. I definitely want to leave open the possibility that analog experiments might be able to confirm hypotheses about the target system. Instead, I think what these new roles show us is that analog experiments are useful in different ways. There are other roles that they can play. And even if it turns out that they can't succeed in their original goal, they're still useful systems to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. So we have some time for questions. Um, as I said before, you can ask a question either by writing a queue in the chat or by raising your hand in the participants list. Uh, sit hard. Hi, thanks. That was a, a helpful talk. I was curious about, I'm still a little bit skeptical about the second role that you mentioned, which is teaching us something about the uh, target system. And I appreciate that there might be independent value to these experiments. And some of my skepticism comes from the fact that one of the reasons why Hawking radiation is so interesting is because we expect at least some arguments just that it doesn't behave in the way that Hawking processes or Hawking-like processes in other system will do, right? Mm -hmm. most, more specifically in the context of the black hole information paradox. Uh, the part of the reason why it's paradoxical is because we expect Hawking radiation to stay thermal throughout the lifetime of the black hole. Whereas in the context of uh, ordinary uh, Hawking processes, we'll have reason to believe that it won't stay thermal, that, it will, that uh, information will start leaking out after some time in the black hole or black hole-like systems lifetime. And, I, and I, I think the fact that Hawking radiation might stay thermal throughout its lifetime uh, depends a lot on the fact that there's a, you know, there's a horizon there, a proper horizon. Whereas I, I imagine none of the systems that we're studying really have those kind of strong horizons there. So, or maybe, maybe they have some way of making them occur. So maybe perhaps you can just comment on that aspect of these experiments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you for the question. I, I don't know about the details of uh, the thermality over time and the information paradox, so I won't be able to uh, really take a line on that. But I think that the kind of the main basis of your point is that there might still be important disanalogies between the source system and the target system and that that might undermine say the possibility of learning about one from the other uh, and i think i totally agree on that uh, so i'm not i i think uh especially with hawking radiation it's important to uh realize that even though there is this more general hawking process there are still interesting open questions about whether the astrophysical process is still something special and still has distinct features that actually make it importantly different from other instantiations of the Hawking process. And this goes back to the transplankian problem that Patricia was discussing earlier. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm definitely not arguing that uh, the exploratory experiments will definitely be able to tell us about the target system and I'm also not arguing um, by suggesting that the community has moved towards thinking about generalized Hawking radiation that uh, the transplanking problem is therefore solved and we are detecting 
astrophysical Hawking radiation, or, or that we definitely do have evidence for astrophysical Hawking radiation, just because we've detected instantiations of this more general type. There's still, I think, yeah, I, I just think you're completely right that there's open questions about the relevant differences that still might be there between the two kinds of effect. Thank you. Good, uh, Nicolò. Nicolò, I think you are muted. Okay, sorry. Now we can hear you, yes. In library, because uh, in my city today, there is some problem with internet connection. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. I, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, hopefully. Okay. In your last slide, uh, you make a configuration that uh, is similar to a lattice. And, uh, and my question is that it is similar to uh, the lattice structure that we can use uh, in quantum information. Um, Sorry, I'm having in, trouble hearing. Would you maybe be able to type your question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. While while he types the question, we can go. We can move on to the next question, Robert. Oh, yeah. Thanks, and it's better like this because it's a kind of follow up uh, to your reply to Sigal. So, what happens to the analogy if if from what you said to Sigal is correct? Uh, why don't we see them as normal experiments? just to probing the internal validity of such experiments without having any external validity to the target system. And why we still want to call them analog systems or analog experiments? Yeah, I think you definitely could argue that uh, the term analog experiment is less appropriate once you move towards these new goals. But I guess the, the kind of picture I have in mind is that you have the analogy lying in waiting until maybe you might be able to use it until you learn more about your target system uh, or until you are able to model more closely the target system in your analog system. Um, but they, I think these experiments definitely are useful in their own right, just as conventional experiments. And in that sense, you, you don't need to call them analog experiments. I do think it's really interesting that in the literature, they are still always called analog experiments. And there is, there is always still this underlying motivation from the target system. I mean, I, I don't, even the, the papers and experiments that seem to correspond most closely to these new goals are written as if the astrophysical effects are still in the background and that's still really what interests them. And I, I don't think that the experiments would be being done if there was no analogy there. And there was no hope for eventually transferring evidence in that way. Uh, but it, depending on your goals in an individual experiment, you could definitely treat it more as just a conventional experiment or more as an analog experiment that you're using to kind of build up your knowledge for the future, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I would also, I would also, sorry, Robert. No, go ahead. Uh, it's like in computer simulation, you can just, analyze the simulation that you have without linking it to any target system, yeah. just for the sake of seeing if it's a computer simulation. I think this is a bit what's happening here. And um, yeah, go ahead. I would, I would also only add to something to what Ray said, that it's not so trivial to know what is analogous and what is this analogous when we mm. analyze analog systems. So that's mm. also something that needs to be investigated further it also by using robustness analysis. So in with respect to Nicolos, no, he was Nicolos, I don't remember what was the name. Uh, Sidart question. Um, so you, you do have event horizons in the or acoustic horizons in the analog system. So the question is whether that horizon is good enough to, to recover the properties that you're interested in. And I think that's not an easy, an, an easy question to answer. Mm -hmm, definitely. So now, Pavan. Hi, uh, it was a good talk. Uh, my question is uh, that, uh, do you have, a, uh, can you tell if there are other examples of uh, these kinds of universalities where one of the systems is inaccessible or 
unmanipulable uh, and how did it turn out in those cases uh, were were the analog systems significantly useful mm -hmm. in learning about the target systems mm -hmm. so this is where i'm going to go back to the question i asked patricia earlier and uh, reference the stellar nuclear synthesis case so because i I think that that probably is an example where this works. So there's um, this is a paper by Karinte Bo and P. Evans where they they talk about analog experiments and respond to Crowther et al.'s criticism, and they're trying to argue that accessibility itself doesn't matter, and that if we have the right universality arguments or independent principles that we can use to kind of triangulate between the source and target systems, then we can actually uh, gain confidence about the target system without directly accessing it. And the case here is, uh, so, so you're looking at the nuclear reactions in a star, essentially, uh, and you're never able to directly access what happens on those scales in the interior of the star you're only able to maybe indirectly access some other information that comes out of the star and also just like with the black hole you obviously can't manipulate the star but the idea is that based on uniformity principles based on uniformity across space and time that seems to be independently empirically supported for all of the other laws of nature that we have we have very good reason to believe that nuclear reactions will happen in the sun in the same way that they happen on earth and that therefore we can run experiments on the kinds of atoms and isotopes that we think uh, are relevant in in this reaction in in stars and actually use that to directly gain confirmation confidence that we have the correct model of what happens in stars i i think i would want to argue that that is an example of this whole network, the Bayesian network that I showed being effective and providing confirmation, even though the, the bridge principle there, the universality argument isn't of this kind of technical Wilsonian condensed matter type of argument. But Patricia, maybe you would have. Um... No, I have a similar view. Yep. Okay. Let's see, more, more research needs to be done. Mm -hmm. In this, in these inaccessible systems. Uh, so Nicolo was able to type his question. He says, in your slides, you show a structure similar to a lattice. Do you think we can make a correlation to the lattice of quantum information? I'm not sure I fully understand. Maybe he's question. talking about the Bayesian network. That the you, Bayesian network. Maybe, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so the Bayesian network isn't, meant to be directly about lattices the maybe nicola you could follow up with more okay we can definitely talk about it on sack but the one thing about lattices that i would mention is that the um for the wilsonian universality arguments that are very successful the underpinning similarities the type of structure that those systems need to share to underpin that similarity or to that put them in the same universality class is that they can all be described by lattices so that's that's the kind of microphysical feature that you would like to be able to say that the source and target systems share in order to be confident that you can run the same universality argument on them uh, but for hawking radiation and analog uh, astrophysical analog black holes and astrophysical black holes that's exactly the kind of microphysical structure that we're not confident that the systems share I don't know if that helps, but we can yeah. talk on Slack. Uh, Katie had a follow up, I think, on the previous question, right? Yeah, just on this point about um, the, so I don't know the paper about the uh, synthesis and the uh, star, but I was wondering, um, and maybe, yeah, maybe it's just a clarification, I was wondering if that was a slightly different case in that um, whilst it's inaccessible, we think it's like the very same physical processes that are going on as we see in other places. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the kind of um, analog cases, like we know that it's a different uh, physical uh, process going on. It's just like has certain similarities to it. So I, yeah, I guess my follow-up was just like, I wondered if there was a kind of distant 
I don't want to say this analogy, that's too many analogies there. I wondered if the star case was like importantly different from yeah. the cases you've been discussing. I actually think that the the biggest difference with the star case is that the, the star actually isn't inaccessible. <laughs> so the the micro physics of the star might be inaccessible. The exact processes that you're mm -hmm. interested in, you can't directly probe. Yeah. But the star itself provides you information that is related to those yeah. processes that is accessible. And I think that's the key difference. So you, you don't, you just need to have confidence that, so you, you need to, enough to get confidence that they are the same processes that are happening, like you just said. And I think for the star, you do get that confidence because it is accessible to that extent. Mm -hmm. But for Hawking radiation, you don't have that confidence. Mm. It, it seems like in the star case, like the principles of uniformity that you were mentioning are more to do yeah. with like, um, we expect the laws of nature to be the same across the universe, which seems like a different issue. Yeah. Precisely the question seems to be with analog experiments is like, are these the same laws? Like maybe not. Um, yeah, yeah. And it, yeah. No, the, I, I think that that's something I haven't quite figured out uh, what I think about yet, yeah, whether uniform principles can play the same role as universality arguments in this context mm -hmm. or whether that's like a completely different form I guess I guess somebody like John Norton would say no yeah. you need to have some kind of material connection anyway, yeah yeah I'll be quiet now but thank you yeah thank you interesting discussion so the last question Kirill uh, just a very short comment exactly on this um, I think it can be very made quite precise what is the difference and what is the similarity between what you have in the nu nuclear reaction rates in the sun performing nuclear burning and when you perform uh, nuclear experiments on earth and what is different is obviously the, the gravity so on earth you have 9.81 meter over s squared gravity which is several orders of magnitude slower than in the core of the sun but what is the same is the density. And so when you have the same density, this is what is important when you do the calculation of cross sections. And so I guess the only way to argue that the stellar nuclear synthesis uh, argument works for the uh, uh, stellar physics analog is by, by the density, because this is what, what matters when you want to calculate the, the reaction rates. And so that's um, a stellar astrophysicist uh, point of view at least. And build further on this in, in nuclear physics of, 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 of stellar nuclear astrophysics, it's uh, the nuclear reaction rate and core helium burning is actually very uncertain. The carbon 12 um, alpha gamma reaction. And this is exactly for this reason that we, on Earth, we can't, um, we can't generate these conditions that you, we have in the sun, such dense conditions. We just, we just can't accelerate uh, the, mm -hmm. the nuclei still have the nuclei at this density uh, to mimic the um, conditions that are in the sun. So the, yeah, just to comment on this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, interesting discussion and we can continue it in Slack. So thank you again, Grace, that was very, very nice. And thank you for the question. We come back all at 4.30 if I'm not wrong. Bye-bye, see you later. <laughs>